You're listening to the Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda, recording from Washington, D.C. And I'm your co-host, Katie Putz, recording from Maryland. Good to be back with you, Katie. How are you doing today? Great. Uh, so we promised our listeners a few weeks ago that we'd be back to talk about Ukraine. Uh, we sort of did not do that in the last episode uh, due to um, circumstances. But I did want to sort of make good on that promise because certainly the conflict uh, and the tragedy in Ukraine continues to play out. Uh, the military campaign by Russia uh, has certainly seen its fair share of setbacks, uh, but there's very few signs that this war is about to end anytime soon. Um, and so... Uh, Katie, I thought we could talk about some of the things that we didn't get to in our first discussion on Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of listeners are generally interested uh, in the idea of some of the lessons that Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, that Russia's invasion of Ukraine might hold for the other potential invasion that uh, Asia hands think a lot about, which is the possibility of an invasion by China of Taiwan across the Taiwan Strait. Um, now, I want to begin this by saying that, you know, I'm fully aware that there are many important differences between, obviously, the geopolitical situations, uh, the relationship between Taiwan uh, and, and the outside world, Taiwan's status in the international community that make a sort of one-to-one -one comparison, uh, perhaps a little bit overplayed. I, I certainly have seen a fair share of commentary that I think really um, leans a bit too much into similarities where there are fewer. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about primarily, frankly speaking, the consequences that Chinese leaders might be taking away uh, from Russia's military campaign, what that might be telling them about the risks of, of resorting to a war of choice effectively uh, to realize geopolitical objectives. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, I think, fancy themselves historians in some ways and have views about, you know, why Ukraine isn't a country and why Taiwan is part of China, respectively, that could influence them to behave in ways um, that could still lead to a conflict. Uh, but I thought it'd be fun to sort of uh, interrogate some of these uh, assumptions uh, that sort of underlie this comparison. Uh, so, uh We'll, we'll sort of begin there, and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, something we did discuss last time, which is the effect of Russia's economic isolation on Central Asia, and then a little bit more on the political economic consequences more broadly across the Asian region. So that's a bit of a preview of what we'll get to today. Uh, so Katie, where should we uh, where should we start with the Taiwan discussion, do you think? I mean, I think the, the best place we should start is really, you know, what are, what are the lessons that we can draw? You know, as you said, there are a number of differences between the two situations, a number of differences in the both the geography of, of a you know Russian invasion of Ukraine versus a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Um, but there I think people keep talking about this uh, and it, it's worth inspecting. Um, you know, when Beijing is watching what's happening in Ukraine, uh, what do you think the conclusions at this point they might be drawing? You know, do you think this makes it more likely for China to try to invade Taiwan or or is this sort of a cautionary tale? Because Russia's invasion of Ukraine is not going the way that I think the Kremlin originally thought it would go um, and certainly not going the way many people thought it was going to go in the early days when you were looking at just the strict military difference between yeah. Ukraine and Russia. Um, so if you have any thoughts on that, I'd be definitely interested in your uh analysis. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, I think your last point is absolutely on the money, which is that uh, military analysts uh, in the West, uh, pretty much everywhere around the world expected Ukraine uh, to be rolled over by what was, you know, largely perceived to be a far superior um, Russian conventional military. Uh, that obviously did not happen. Uh, and so the correlation of forces before the invasion began and everything we knew about Russian military doctrine and Russian strategy and Russian capabilities really had little to do with how the war played out in practice. Mm -hmm. um, now, I do want to emphasize that, you know, there were, I believe, a unique set of organizational factors uh, that sort of played into Russia's poor performance. Um, you know, uh, in the lead up to the invasion, I was sort of making the point that, uh, you know, when the discussion was happening about is Putin bluffing or is he serious? Uh, you know, the point that was being made was that, uh, well, for a bluff to be effective, it has to look really indistinguishable from the real thing. And I think Putin mm -hmm. did that decently, uh, not only to the point where the outside world, especially many countries in Europe, uh, continue to believe this was a bluff until the very last minutes before the invasion. Uh, you know, France comes to mind in, uh, in, in particular. But also, yeah, and, and yeah, I right. just want to interject on that point. There was certainly a lot of um, 
sort of criticism of the Biden administration in the in the in the period in February between sort of the issuing of these warnings and these intelligence analysis that Russia is actually getting ready to invade. Uh, there were there was a certain subset of people who kind of looked at that and was like, they're they, they're the ones who are bluffing. This is not really what's happening. So there was certainly a lot of, um, you know, I, I give credit to the Biden administration and the intelligence community for getting it right and telling right. everybody what was about to happen. But it was interesting to watch sort of the, um, can I curse on this podcast? The oh shit <laughs> moment, you know, where where it was, it was, this is actually real and happening. Um, yeah. And I'm curious, you um, know, would would China's bluffs be similar? Um, would well, we be? Ju- I'm sure the debate would be very vibrant. Um, yes and no. This is going to happen. This happens every time. There's uh, an article w- of which the diplomat has run plenty, uh, envisioning and charting through a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Well, so you know what I was about to say was that the Russian bluff was actually, in a way, effective inside Russia to the point where Russian conscripts and Russian <laughs> troops and even even lower level mm-hmm. Russian commanders, if not the generals, uh, really had no idea that they're about to go to war. And that obviously affects morale. It affects the sense of what one is trying to accomplish on the battlefield. And obviously the Ukrainians had the complete opposite here, which they had incredibly high morale and a very clear purpose, which was that they're defending their homes against an invader. Uh, and so I think that really uh, appeared to have a significant effect in the earliest moments of conflict. Uh, and then, you know, I mean, the sort of Russian, so, uh, you know, Russia sort of holding back in a way on the, on the use of large scale fires early on mm-hmm. in conflict. They did use fires. They did use precision ballistic missiles, but to very limited strategic effect. And so to flip this around now to think about a Chinese scenario, uh, you know, the first thing to say is that um, the offense is always more challenging uh, in, in, a, in a land contingency, the traditional sort of balance you want to have is, you know, three times the capability of the defender, which is not easy to do in many cases. And in the amphibious situation, which is what China is going to have to deal with with an invasion across the Taiwan Strait, um, that goes up to about five to one, which which the PLA can muster up. Certainly there's a quantitative advantage there that favors China. Um, but one of the lessons that China may be taking here is that internally, um, you know, there needs to be a clear sense of purpose about what exactly is going to happen. And I think mm-hmm. one of the things that's really remarkably different uh, in my mind is that what we saw in Ukraine was really downstream of Putin's own reasoning about um, Ukraine status as as a sovereign country. Uh, Putin sort of asserted that and, and everything that happened, I think, is very much sort of downstream of that decision. In the Chinese context, I mean, you know, we can go back to the Chinese Civil War, the, you know, through the Cold War, uh, you know, the, the idea of unification with Taiwan has been sort of inherently plant a part of what generations mm-hmm. of CCP leaders have been thinking about uh, going all the way back to Mao. I mean, Mao even considered trying to uh, attack Taiwan during the Korean War to sort of opportunistically take advantage of, of the U.S. being distracted at the time. So it's a very different sort of thing. It's something that China is very open about internally. Xi Jinping repeatedly makes references to this. Uh, it's um, um, the, uh, in terms of um, PLA, Ministry of Defense, white papers released for external consumption, the primary war fighting scenario that the PLA plans for is very clearly defined to be Taiwan. So I think that sort of, again, um, you know, factors in uh, to how uh, the PLA might actually approach a Taiwan contingency, which was which is that, you know, if and when she does actually make the decision to initiate an invasion, uh, it, w- it, it, it won't be something that's entirely uh, unexpected uh, is, is sort of what I'm trying to say. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, zooming out a little bit, though, I think one of the lessons uh, that I think has also been apparent to both China and Taiwan, I mean, uh, Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen has, has said quite a bit about this, uh, is the way in which um, not only the West, but a lot of non-Western countries have really united uh, in sort of sanctioning Russia for a wanton violation of the UN Charter and invading a sovereign country. Uh, and so that's that's positive. It's it's sort of, um, you know, this has been the theory that the United States, uh, even under the Trump administration, was trying to put into practice in Asia to better defend Taiwan and better protect Taiwan from China's efforts to isolate it, which was to multilateralize support for Taiwan. Mm-hmm. But but, you know, I want to back up again, which is that I talked about the U.N. Charter. Uh, and here, of course, we get into the different statuses that Ukraine and Taiwan have in the international system, Ukraine being a U.N. member state and Taiwan, of course, not being one. And uh, that distinction, you know, shouldn't matter in practice because Taiwan, in my view, for all intents and purposes, is a sovereign country. But it will matter to, you know, the reaction of countries like Singapore, for instance, I think is a good example, right? Singapore very sparingly applies unilateral sanctions. It chose to sanction Mm -hmm. Russia on the basis of the UN charter being violated. So would Singapore react similarly in a Taiwan invasion? It's not clear to me. Uh, And and would other countries react the same way? Uh, it's, it's, It's really not clear. Uh, but then there's other factors, which is that 
you know, the nature of the U.S. relationship with Taiwan is also very different. Uh, the U.S. Uh, since since the Taiwan Relations Act uh, and and the conclusion of the three communiques with China has seen Taiwan as as an important partner, has supported Taiwan's independent defense. Uh, and, and that relationship uh, really has much deeper roots uh, than the nature of post-Cold War cooperation with Ukraine uh, and the acceleration mm-hmm. of cooperation with Ukraine since the invasion of Crimea in, in 2014. So there's there's a lot of, I think, differences that really make mapping this pretty difficult. And of course, getting in the heads of how exactly Chinese leaders are, are thinking about this is also uh, quite difficult. But I think the military lessons might be a little bit uh, clearer in some ways. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the word that kind of sums it up as ambiguity. There's a lot of ambiguity about the the situation uh, between China and Taiwan and what the global response to an invasion in that theater would be for the, for the reasons that you laid out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, the final thing I'll say is that on, on, on some level, the internal messaging in, in Taiwan, you know, is that if we fight like the Ukrainians do and we hold out, you know, the world is going to eventually support us. Uh, the U.S. is going to back us. Uh, the international community will rally behind Taiwan. And I think that is actually a very important lesson uh, that, you know, this this sense of fatalism that, you know, Taiwan really can't stand up to the overwhelming might of the PLA. Uh, that's, I think, important to push back on. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, again, factors into broader debates about what Taiwan should be doing in terms of its uh, defense investments, investing in a so-called porcupine strategy of uh, anti-access uh, area denial against China, making it more difficult for the PLA to actually sustain uh, high intensity operations across the Taiwan Strait, uh, making it as difficult as possible for uh, PLA forces to uh, land on Taiwanese beaches and so forth. Uh, so a lot of that, I think, is again going to get uh, a serious uh, rethink as a result of um, a lot of this. Yeah, and I, I think just to add to that, there's um, there's an important sort of civilian aspect uh, to a potential conflict scenario that we see playing out in Ukraine in terms of sort of territorial defense groups and sort of the um, so the fighting spirit of the Ukrainian people and, and how that would play out in the Taiwan context. So it's not just necessarily about military hardware and, and the correct strategy. It's also about a, a civilian support for defending. Taiwan uh, in the way that the Ukrainian people have chosen to defend Ukraine. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think the the ultimate thing is that, you know, it's all of this has just been a a tremendous reminder of the fact that, you know, war is an inherently chaotic human enterprise that's very difficult Mm -hmm. to sort of predict uh, in, uh, you know, ahead of it actually happening. Until it happens, you don't actually know how things are going to play out. And and for, uh, for a defender like Taiwan with the odds stacked against it, certainly, uh, just looking at the balance of power, uh, I think I think that's again you know an important takeaway uh, that mm-hmm. that that when you fight uh, and you and you're fighting for a good purpose and the, and the world is behind you that can really make a significant difference. Um, so I do want to sort of um, you know shift gears a bit, Katie, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the other um, updates that have happened since the last time we talked about Ukraine. Um, we, we emphasized last time, we did talk about this in some detail, uh, we emphasized the vulnerability and the exposure that Central Asia uh, and Central Asian countries uh, have to the isolation of the Russian economy uh, in the sense of remittances and, and trade and uh, just longstanding economic ties there. Uh, as I understand it, things have gotten quite a bit worse uh, since the um, discussion we had several weeks ago. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the situation now economically in Central Asia and how the downstream effects of Russia's economic isolation are playing out? So the there are both sort of downsides and some uh, opportunities that I'll, I'll mention, but uh, certainly on the downsides, the condition of the Russian economy uh, is devastating for the millions of Central Asian migrant workers who are in Russia. Um, there are uh, the, the number varies, but it's, you know, it, it's a massive number. It's um, so Kyrgyzstan uh, and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan send the most number of migrant workers. Um, there, Uzbekistan has a much larger population, so it sends, you know, 4 million and it's not that many compared to its 30, 35 million population. Um, but it's somewhere around a quarter of, of Kyrgyzstan's uh, population travels to Russia for work. And what they do is they, they make money not just for themselves, but they send it back to their families. And so there have been a number of really good um, and, and heartbreaking reports that have come out about you know, Central Asian migrants in 
cities like Moscow losing their jobs. So, you know, if, if a business is trimming down, some of the first workers to be laid off are the Central Asians uh, and, and they can't find other work in Russia, but there's also no jobs back in Central Asia for them to go to. So they're sort of stuck. Uh, and then their families who rely on them to send money back also don't have funds. Um, a secondary issue is the the currency issue. So the cratering of the ruble has really made it extremely unprofitable uh, to send money back because the the um, the transfer rate is just terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this has the of I, I I worry about sort of the social impact of this. Um, you know, if you have being able to send young men who don't have jobs to Russia to get jobs has been a pressure valve for Central Asian countries. Um, You know, large populations of unemployed young men never does good things for social cohesion. And and so I I am concerned about what happens in the the political spheres of Central Asia if this goes on um, indefinitely. But there are some interesting economic opportunities, I would say. I think Kazakhstan in particular is what I want to talk about. Um, Kazakhstan has maintained its neutral position. Um, it has not condemned Russia necessarily, but it has also said pretty pretty stridently that Ukraine is a sovereign country, uh, ha- should have territorial integrity, and they, they want the war to stop. Uh, but has also said, you know, we if there's going to be a new Iron Curtain, we don't want to be behind it. Uh, They have told European leaders that they're not going to help Russia circumvent sanctions. But at the same time, they've said to Russian businesses and also European businesses that cater to the the Russian and the former Soviet Union space, hey, you can come set up shop in Kazakhstan. Um, and, And there are some stories of businesses taking advantage of this offer. Uh, I wrote this week about a motorcycle company. It's called the Ural Motorcycle Company. It dates back to World War II era. They uh, manufacture and assemble uh, those sort of, you know, if you watch Indiana Jones and he's in this sidecar uh, (laughs) motorcycle, that's the kind of motorcycle that they produce. Um, They've uh, they announced last week that they're going to be moving their assembly operation about 400 miles south into Kazakhstan. Um, And the reason that they've decided to do that is they've had difficulty importing parts. Uh, They've had difficulty with partners and and sort of um, externally. And then they've had difficulty exporting motorcycles uh, with Russia um, lost its most favored nation status um, in a number of countries, including Australia, Canada, and the United States. And so that ratchets up tariffs for imports. Um, Japan last, I think it was last week, or it might've been the week before that, uh, put out a list of of 38 uh, goods that they will not import from Russia anymore. And on that list is motorcycles. So if this company wants to sell motorcycles in Japan, it has to be made somewhere that's not Russia. And so it's an interesting opportunity for Kazakhstan to attract businesses. Um, But these are still, I, I think, this is a short-term boon. Um, I, you know, if the war ends tomorrow, which it probably won't, um, if the war ends tomorrow, these companies will want to return to Russia. Um, but in the short term, it could generate some jobs in Kazakhstan, will certainly increase some economic activity. Um, but this economic activity doesn't necessarily help the people who have lost jobs because of uh, the war, uh, the migrant workers who are in Russia who work in things like construction. Um, it's not necessarily a one-to-one. Those who are losing out are going to benefit. Um, but there are some interesting sort of knock-on opportunities for countries like Kazakhstan if they can stay in the middle. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting case study, actually. Um, not something that I think um, many, many had predicted when the when the war began, because I think the initial reaction was that, uh, you know, which is what is happening, uh, that this is just a very bad thing for Central Asia across the board. And, and you know, you're right that it's not going to offset the the damage to many ordinary Central Asians. Um, so, Katie, I thought we could maybe close out by just reflecting a little bit on, you know, what's changed and what really has it in terms of um, how the region, uh, the Asia Pacific region more generally has reacted to the war. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think since we last had our discussion, there's been What's been interesting to me is sort of uh, the divide between many Asian governments and public opinion, uh, right? I mean, two interesting examples that sort of come to mind uh, as sort of maybe illustrative examples are Singapore and South Korea. Uh, So we already talked a little bit about Singapore, which has been very much siding with the West uh, and sort of um, condemning Russia. 
but then when you look at sort of public opinion in Singapore, uh, particularly the view of um, ethnic sort of Chinese Singaporeans, um, the the views are a little bit more sort of circumspect about the narrative, uh, you mm. know, and, and sort of a little bit more sympathetic uh, to to the notion that, you know, the war was caused by sort of NATO expansion and, and you know, Ukraine trying to join NATO, so on and so forth. So there's this sort of interesting tension. It's not actually going to, I think, affect the Singaporean government's decision making. Uh, but that sort of dynamic, I think, is is notable. And then you sort of have the flip side of that in South Korea, where, uh, you know, it made news when um, Vladimir uh, Zelensky, uh, Ukraine's president, spoke to the South Korean National Assembly and the attendees uh, at, at, you know, South Korean lawmakers were very few of them actually showed up. Uh, and there was like, you know, they looked distracted. They didn't really um, give Zelensky any kind of standing ovation as he's gotten elsewhere. Uh, but then you look at the, the South Korean public's views. And again, the South Korean public's views are very strongly aligned uh, behind the, the broader sort of Western effort to isolate Russia. And so these dynamics, I think, are interesting. And, you know, with South Korea, of course, I should note that South Korea is about to have a change of government with the, with the presidential inauguration on May 10th with an incoming conservative president uh, who has been saying a lot of the right things on Russia uh, and, and Ukraine. Uh, you know, I think he's much more interested in taking a forward leading position uh, than the outgoing Moon administration. Uh, but, you know, those dynamics, I think, have been interesting. Uh, and then elsewhere, I think we really just see uh, a lot of continuity. You know, India is still walking its neutrality tightrope of not explicitly criticizing Russia, but sending aid to Ukraine. And uh, there have been some uncomfortable conversations between the United States and India, uh, which is a democracy and a quad partner about uh, you know, New Delhi's reaction. Uh, but India has, you know, many dependencies on Russia, as we talked about last time, from energy to uh, defense. Uh, and so that's uh, been, I think, um, more difficult uh, for um, the United States to actually sway India on this. Uh, do, you, do any other countries sort of jump out to you in terms of um, recent developments since we last talked? <laughs> I mean, I, th I think you've hit sort of the main ones. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning um, some news that came out today uh, about uh, Biden's upcoming trip to Asia. Yes. Uh, it, was, it was announced today. Um, and that, that uh, I have two things to say about that. One, I think Ukraine will obviously be a major part of the conversation when the Quad convenes in Japan. Um, I think May 24th, I mm -hmm. believe, is yes. the date. Um, and so that... Uh, I think it's an interesting sort of tying of the Asia agenda with what's happening in Europe, because um, there's plenty of criticism um, that, you know, Biden is distracted by Europe in the way that previous U.S. presidents have been distracted by, say, the Middle East or Afghanistan and, and not paying enough attention to Asia. To take an Asia trip right now is, I think, meaningful. Um, and so I'm curious to see uh, I'm sure there will be conversations about Ukraine there with countries like Japan, Australia, which have been um, very much on the U.S. side of how to approach Ukraine. Uh, but India will be there, too. So it'll be an opportunity to kind of touch base on that. And the second reason that's interesting is it comes like three days after the Australian federal election. So it's unclear that there will be an Australian prime minister to attend this summit. Um, you know, I, I think maybe when they scheduled this, Morrison was like super confident that that uh, the coalition is gonna, going to win. He'll still be prime minister. But it's also possible that he's no longer prime minister. Um, and, and in parliamentary systems, it can take some time to get a new prime minister in office. So I think it'll be interesting to see who represents Australia. Yeah. Um, but I, that's a little bit of a, an aside, but I thought it was something worth worth mentioning. Um, also, but I think I think that's actually a good segue, Katie, into uh, offering our listeners a preview of the upcoming issue of the magazine. Absolutely. Um, I would never do that on purpose. Uh, yeah. So the the magazine will be coming out later this week. It's the May issue um, on the cover. Uh, we are going to be uh, asking the question of can the U.S. deter a Taiwan invasion? So it will be sort of a good uh link up with the discussion we had earlier in this this um, conversation. Uh, and then some of the other major pieces in the magazine, uh, one focuses on the China narrative in the Australian federal election. There has been, a, um, you know, there's a need to have a discussion about China policy in Australia, but the tone of the conversation during the election campaign has not exactly uh, addressed the real policy questions. Australia and China have not had high level diplomatic contact in 
two years. Uh, That's a major issue. But instead, both parties are sort of accusing the other of being bought out by China. Um, So that's that's a that's a really interesting and timely piece. Uh, We also look at Japan's constitution at 75, uh, the the peace constitution at, at a time when there's uh, you know, an act of conflict in in Europe, and Japan is very clearly on on the the western side uh, side of this. Um, so it's a, it's a good time to kind of look at the constitution and and what kind of debates surround it now. Um, and then a final piece, um, which I think is really important, um, is by a, an Afghan journalist we've done a lot of work with, um, looking at uh, the work that the Afghan diasporas around the world have done to continue to support uh, people in Afghanistan at a time where, as this podcast somewhat illustrates, we spend a lot of time talking about Ukraine. We're not really talking about Afghanistan, and there's just a massive humanitarian crisis going on. And so it's a really important um, piece on the, the work the diaspora community has done to continue to send aid and, and, and help uh, their, their families, their loved ones, people they don't know back in Afghanistan. Um, so I hope everybody checks out the magazine. It, it's it's our 90th issue, which uh, I'm pretty excited about. All right, we're getting closer to that big 100. Uh, we'll, we'll I'm going to next... have to figure out how to throw a magazine party. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks for that update, Katie. Uh, and, you know, on the Australia piece, uh, I sort of want to offer listeners just a preview of what we're probably talking about on the next episode, uh, which is Solomon Island's new security pact with China, which is certainly sending waves through the South Pacific, uh, here in Washington, uh, and, and certainly in Canberra. So we'll talk a little bit about the implications of that agreement. Uh, and then also on the, on the Japan piece and, the, uh, and, and Japan's constitution, um, you know, I'm, I'm personally pretty closely tracking uh, Japan's uh, ongoing debates uh, leading up to a new national security strategy under Prime Minister Kishida and uh, new national defense program guidelines and, and the whole debate about um, a counterattack capability, formerly known as an enemy-based strike capability, uh, the, the notion that Japan will start acquiring um, missile systems for precision strikes. So uh, that'll be something that we'll probably put on the docket for discussion on a future episode as well. Certainly a lot coming up. It's going to be, it's going to be a, busy, uh, a busy few months uh, in, in Asia. But uh, Katie, thanks a lot for uh, joining me again. As always, it's a pleasure, Ankit. Great. Uh, So for our listeners, if you like what you heard on the show, make sure you subscribe so you can keep up with future episodes. And if you've been a subscriber for a while, but you haven't yet left us a review, please do that. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, wherever you get your shows. Uh, We really do appreciate that. So thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back soon with more.